Happy Sabbath, everyone. Happy Sabbath, everyone. We're going to talk this afternoon about how to be a doctor in a day. And I see some smiles, and if anybody's frowning, you're probably a doctor. <laughs> Let's bow our heads. Father, we're grateful for this opportunity, Lord, to speak a word in due season, for there are, there's somebody that's weary. There's somebody that needs hope. And Father, we need an enlightenment and instruction for today. We need to be inspired to know that you have a plan. And so bless us, Father, send your spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, you know, we have to come up with a good title. Amen. And how to be a doctor in a day, I think, by God's grace, um, would inspire you to open your ears and maybe wake up a little bit. Amen? We are not trying to actually be a medical doctor in a day. Can we say amen? They go through grueling schooling, painting in training expensive, extensive, intensive care. Rounds and rounds of it, can we say amen? I don't actually envy them, but I take my hat off, amen? But we do need to understand that there are principles of healing that you need to have and that we need to take charge not take charge, give God charge of our bodies. And as we do this, we will see that God will bless. So we want to just give you some very, very important principles that you need to know in order to be healthy today. Is that all right? Now, you're already doing it, but if you turn in your Bibles to Galatians chapter 6, verse 6, Galatians chapter 6 and verse 6, the Bible says that you just can't sit here quietly. Can we say amen? amen. <laughs> it says, let him that is taught in the word do what? Amen. Communicate to him that teacheth in all good things. And so I have some questions for you. We have some dialogue. We have some back and forth. And I need your help. Do I have your participation today? Yes. Amen. Praise the Lord. We're going to review. Um, this is a scripture that we read this morning. The title of this morning's message was none of these what? Diseases. And the Bible says, and said, if thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God. You know, that diligently hearken. Has anybody ever asked maybe we're not going to ask for a show of hands but wives you, you you've asked your husbands to do something and 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 maybe it wasn't done quite right and um, you know how come you didn't do this well you know I said this well, well I guess I didn't hear you that well but when we diligently hearken we're really really listening amen if thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, will do, so not only do we hear, but we do that which is right in his sight. And the Bible says we have to give ear to his commandments and do what? Keep all his statutes. There is one of the most powerful promises in the word of God. He said, I will put none of these diseases upon thee, which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healeth thee. And in this morning, we learned a principle on how to study the Bible. We learned that the chapter and verses of the Bible are not inspired. Oh, no, he didn't come all the way to Fayetteville and tell us the word of God was not inspired. We didn't say the word of God was not inspired. We said the chapter and verse divisions 
are not inspired. And the reason why that's important for you to know is that right after God says, if they would just listen and obey, they won't get cancer, arthritis, diabetes, and all these other diseases, there's only four verses later that the people said, give me meat, give me meat, give me meat. I would ask you to repeat after me, but I learned a long time ago from a preacher as I was a little boy, he said, Pastor Smith, he's not alive anymore. He baptized me. But he said, repetition deepens the impression and sharpens the intellect. So I'm not going to have you repeat, we want meat. Amen? <laughs> Amen. God is good. And so we find that only four verses later, they said, we want, we're not even going to mention it. And then the next verse, God said, then said the Lord unto Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and, for the, and the people shall go out and gather a certain rate every day. Now listen to the wording. That I may prove them whether they will walk in my law. Now did he say anything a few verses early about what would happen if we walk in his law? What did he say would happen? So then he said, I have to give them a test to see if they're willing to walk in my law. You know, we let you know this morning, we did not come here to simply say, hey, folks, we need to give up our chicken and fish. But God said, you're not even on the highway to health until you give up the flesh of dead animals. There's many other things he had to share with them about health, but he said, I'm going to test them to see if they'll walk in my law. I have never, I, I've, you know, we're going to talk about some eyeglasses in a minute. You'll see what I'm talking about. I have seen people cured of cancer. You're going to meet somebody tomorrow, if you come back, who had a blood pressure that was 220 over 110, and it would not budge. I don't care what kind of natural remedy you gave them and they had an allergic reaction to the drug medication, it would lay them out cold. So what were they to do? That person's blood pressure in 20 days went from that number, which is stroke level blood pressure, down to 120 over 80. And we're going to tell you this afternoon how it was done. And everybody has the remedy in your house. I believe the Bible says, let him that is taught in the word communicate. <laughs> You've got the remedy that drops blood pressure from, from 220 over 110 down to 120 over 80, and every one of you has it in your house. So come back this afternoon, can we say Amen. <laughs> As we move forward, brothers and sisters, you know, when you talk about certain subjects, it can be sensitive subjects. When you start telling people to change what's in their refrigerator, take food out of their cupboard and replace it with something else, uh, you're on dangerous ground. But friends, we need to understand that Adam and Eve got us into the mess we are in, and all they did, they, they didn't kill anybody, they didn't rob a bank, they did not um, steal any grand items like cars or anything. We are in the mess we are in because they ate from the wrong what? Menu. Tree. Amen? Isn't that true? See, when you look at it, all they did is ate from the wrong menu. You know, God really does want us to understand what he wants. Now, I've been wearing glasses for a long time, and uh, these are actually glasses. You definitely don't want the one on that side because it's like, um, you know, that person doesn't really want to see. But the reason I brought this up is because when you talk about 
health and we talk about you come up with a title, how to be a doctor in a day, everybody's kind of wondering and, you know, where is he going and, and, and all of this. I want us to understand a principle. The principle is all of us have glasses. Even if you don't wear glasses, you have a perspective of every, of every subject that you know about. Now what you must understand and what we must all understand is our glasses represent our education and our experience. Those are the lenses that we look through. Amen? So if my background and education was different than yours, what I see or think I see will be different than what you see or think you see. And we tend to be a little critical of each other not considering, well, he's just, you know, he's, he's, he's had a different experience. Or, you know, she, she had a different upbringing. You know, God wants us to be more open and allow the Holy Spirit to help us help each other. And that happens when you let the Holy Spirit help you to realize that everybody doesn't have the same experience. Now, the reason I say this is because I will say some things that just probably sound radical might sound different, might sound crazy, especially if you're in the medical profession. But you must understand, for the last 25 years, I've had on some glasses. And they might be different than your glasses. Is that all right? I have worked with people, cried with people, lived with people, labored with people. Some have lived, some have died. But I have seen that this health plan that God gave us in the Bible, it really works. Amen? Amen? Amen. Now, why did I say some have died? Well, guess what? Did you know that they were following the health plan of the Bible at the time of the flood? Living almost a thousand years before they started eating meat? And that pure vegetarian diet, in eating that pure vegetarian diet, Genesis 6, 5 says of them that the imaginations of the thoughts of their heart was evil continuously. Somebody told me Hitler was a vegetarian. So just being a vegetarian, brothers and sisters, does not make you holy. Can we say amen? amen. But if you want to hear God's voice, you'll hear it better from broccoli than a beefsteak. Is that all right? Is that all right? All right. Praise the Lord. So because we come from different backgrounds, I have this hard thing that I have to do. I have to build confidence because I really want to help you. I raised, I'm not even going to do a show of hands, but I, I asked a, a show of hands this morning. Well, I might as well. How, how many in here, and if you don't want to answer, you're, you're off the hook, but, but if you don't mind, how many of us are taking at least one medication a day? Okay. All right. There were more in the first service, so I know some of y'all just don't want to say. That's fine. That's fine. Now, the question I asked in the first service was, and I know all the sick people didn't come to the first service, so, you know. <laughs> if I was to take your medication, what would happen to me? I could die, depending on what it is, but I would at least get what? Sick. Now, before I go any further, I'm not trying to tell you to go cold turkey off of any medication. What I am saying is, we're going to look at, does the plan really work, or do we need to do something else? And we learned and we asked another question in the first service. Since you said I would get sick, then the next question is, why, how can something that would make a well man sick make a sick man well? <laughs> Have mercy. You know, it's some of the simple things in life that we, you know, simple questions. So it's telling us the plan of treating disease with toxic drugs is not the plan that will get you well. And in all that, I didn't say go home and just stop taking your drugs. There's a way. Amen. All right? But the point being made, brothers and sisters, is... We want to develop some confidence. And because here I am, this who is this young whippersnapper coming down here telling us, and we don't even know who this guy is. He claims all these 
to be all, you know, to have this place and see all these things. How can I develop confidence in this group today? That's the question. Well, there's only two ways to develop confidence. One is called a letter method, and what is called a word method. What is the first method? And what's the second method? Word. word. That's the only two ways, really, that people develop confidence. You know, let's talk about the letter method. It is amazing to me that somebody can come and tell you to eat dirt, but if they have three letters at the end of their name, P, H, and D, some of us say, can I get a fork and a spoon? Or do I have to eat the dirt just from my hand? And some of them don't even have three letters. Just two, what are they? M and D. Now, there's nothing wrong with these letters, brothers and sisters. It is a method that builds confidence. Can we say amen? That's the letter method. Nothing wrong with it. It's not the method that Jesus used, however. Jesus used the word method. The Bible says then he called his 12 disciples and together and gave them power and authority over all devils and to do what, everybody? To cure disease. You see, brothers and sisters, when we think about the Gospel Commission, we go all the way to Mark 16 and Matthew 28 at the end of Christ's earthly life. He gave the Gospel Commission near the very beginning of his public ministry, and he gave unlearned men authority over cancer. Am I telling the truth or am I lying to you? It's not comfortable, but am I lying to you? I'm telling you the truth. And see, the word method connects you with truth. And that's why it's so beautiful. The Bible says, Then when he was coming to Galilee, the Galileans received him, having seen all the things that he did at Jerusalem at the feast, for they also went into the feast. You see, until you get the word method, see, see everybody who is going to be saved needs the word method. Amen. There are some of us who can be blessed with both. If you're blessed with both, praise his holy name. Amen. But everybody needs the word method. Amen. You see, the word method will cause you to go to work. The letter method causes you to put in resumes and find a job. We gotta go to, we have to go to work. My mother might be sitting here, I can't say we gotta, we got to speak good English. We have to go to work. And see, because we've been influenced, some of us will not go to work because we don't have letters behind our name. And so we say, oh, I'm not going to get involved with health. I'll go to school first. And then 12 years later, we forgot why we went. Now, if you already have it, let's use it to the glory of God. But don't wait until somebody confers a letter on you before you're obedient to a thus saith the Lord. Amen. That's the word method versus the letter method. A couple more scriptures on this point. And the Jews marveled, saying, How knoweth this man letters having never what? You see, the letter method without Christ gives you an arrogant attitude. Did you know that every degree was created by a human? Y'all didn't even hear what I said. Every degree was created by a human. Any humans out here? And they get together and they say, we want to be scholars of the dollar. Let's create an accounting degree. They can tell you the year, the group that said, we're going to get together. We're going to teach this. We're going to teach this. We're going to teach this. And then they go to some government agency. We want you to accredit us. They're human. Just like you. Now, brothers and sisters, I am not against education. Can we say amen? amen? All I am saying is we have a problem in the United States. We won't do what the Bible says because 
we don't think we're capable of doing what the Bible says because the world has taught us that, oh, uh, I can't uh, teach anybody how to be a vegetarian. I better go get a Ph.D. In, in nutrition, and all the while you're trying to study uh, how to be a whatever, you, you're coming down with all these diseases that if you had just followed the simple writings and the word, you know, so then you come out of school all crippled up and you can't help anybody. So all I'm saying is always be obedient. If God adds something to it, so be it. But let's be obedient, and we can get this work done. We are told that every church member should be a medical missionary and every church member doesn't have the money. I want you all to watch, do something. If you think I'm lying to you, you need to go watch a video called The College Conspiracy. I am not against college. It's on video, I'm not against college. On video, I'm not against college. <laughs> but they have purposely created a system that drove the tuition out of the reach of the common person and it's documented. So some of us can't even afford it, okay? And so we have to understand that God wants us to use this method. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with who, everybody? Jesus. They had been with Jesus. You see, brothers and sisters, when you are Working with people, helping people, if all you know is drink water and you go tell your neighbors, drink water, and they see that you care about them, that will mean more to them than any amount of Bible uh, 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 scriptures that you could rattle off because they see that you care. And they see that you have helped them with some health problem. Health principles, simple things, they would do it would do the world wonders if we would follow it. So God has given us this master's card. He's the master. He gave us a card. How would you like a card that never had an expiration date? How would you like unlimited buying power? Boy, some of us would know what to do with that, amen? I mean, I don't even have to pay the bill. You know, it, it, it's way out of my league. Maybe some of you all know about it, but, but there, are, there, is a, there is a level of finance that you reach where you just get a black card. You ever heard of the black card? And if you have a black card, you can just walk in and buy a jet for so many millions of dollars if you got the black card because they just know anybody with that card just represents more money than they can spend in a day. Okay? Well, you have a black card with Jesus, but it's a commission to go to work. It's a commission to take care of your body. It's a commission to learn health principles so that you can tell somebody else. And, and when you present that black card, they're like, oh, he's got a black card. You see, it's not a real card. It's credentials of character that God gives us and he wants us to understand. So as we talk about these lenses, I want to share with you the lens that I've been looking at for the last several years. It says natural means used in accordance with God's will bring about what? Supernatural results. Some of you all might not be familiar. It's one of my favorite authors. It's all biblical. I believe it's supernatural if, if, if you serve a God and follow a plan and none of the diseases of the world, which the Bible says, would fall upon you. For I am the Lord that healeth you. And, 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 and the Bible supports natural remedies. Uh, um, Hezekiah. Um, used one, Jesus used clay and, 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 and spit. You know, I tell you what, some of the remedies that Jesus uses, some people tell me I'm crazy. Jesus spit on people. He spit on a blind man. Am I telling the truth or am I telling a lie? So, so you can laugh at me when I tell you that I deal with my headaches if I ever get one with a hot foot bath. And I deal with my flu, not with a flu shot, but with a little rocket fuel, which my wife's going to demonstrate tomorrow. And it's not going to send you to the moon. Can we say amen? amen? You can laugh at me and you can tell me I'm crazy. But Jesus went and he spit on a man. And the man he spit on was blind, so he couldn't even see it coming. Have mercy. <laughs> am I telling the truth or am I telling a lie? I'm telling the truth. You see, what he was doing, he was giving us principles. The principle he was giving us is not 
to go spit on people. So when you come to Times of Refreshing, I share that principle, and I talk to, let's just say, this, this nice little row here or some of my guests in the next retreat, and I say, what would you do if I, uh, uh, when you first came, I told you I have a special remedy? Mer? Well, you should see this girl's face. Oh, I wish we could get that on camera. You see? But he was teaching a principle. Sometimes, oh, and another, oh, this is a good principle. That same blind man, the crowd brought him to Jesus. Jesus took him away from them. Then he spit on his eyes. You see, you need a personal relationship with Jesus. You can't deal with it based on your mother or your father or your sister or your brother. Yes, sir. No, there was another one in the Bible where it says he spit on the blind man. There's two. He spit on him, brother. Check it out. Yes, sir. There is another one where he spit. I, there's not a person in here that if I spit on the, the dirt and, and made something and put it on you, you would even want. But there is a healing miracle where Jesus, it says, he spit on the man. Okay? All right. We got to move forward, brothers and sisters. Famous day for my family. Called my brother, what was it, uh, November 5, 2009. Uh, Becky knows my brother. We, we're very close in age. He's a year older than me. And uh, I called him, and it was just really weird. I said, I, I was stranded in Walmart. So I called my brother just to catch up with him. We don't get a chance to see each other. He lives in Atlanta. I live two hours outside of Atlanta, but you know how busy life is. So I said, hey, Stan, how you doing? He said, I'm, I'm all right, man. I said, what's going on? He said, I'm stranded at Walmart. I said, you are kidding me. I said, you can't be stranded at Walmart. He said, why can't I be? Because I'm stranded at Walmart. I, this is a true story. Two brothers, two and a half hours away, both of us talking to each other, stranded at Walmart. I called my brother later to find out how he fared. And he told me his story about how he had to get his car towed and all that. And he said, well, how did you fare? I said, well, I got my car started by digging in the trash can. Now, am I telling the truth or am I telling a lie? <laughs> you don't know, right? It's the 100% gospel truth. I dug in the trash can, and then my car started. Now, you all are going to say, Lord, Pastor Shavi, who did you bring? <laughs> it is really the truth. You want to hear the rest of the story? I was sitting in Walmart's parking lot, and it was a very busy day, so I had a lunch with me. And uh, as I was finishing, my wife made food, and it was good food, and I couldn't even finish it. It was kind of like, I don't remember all the circumstances. I wouldn't have been home, and it wasn't anything I could really salvage, but there was still some food left. My, sometime my wife just, you know, gives me more than I need. Amen? And uh, so I just finished eating, walked into Walmart, and on the outside of Walmart, I just threw my trash bag that had some food in it in the trash can. When I came back outside, I could not find my keys. And I was looking high and low. I was praying. I was doing everything I could do. I just sat down. I was, Lord, where are my keys? I ran back into Walmart, went into Lost and Found, retraced all my steps. No keys. And in the quiet of just sitting in discouragement and prayer, the Lord reenacted that situation where the key was hanging on my pinky finger 
and I drop the last maybe apple core in the bag and then I tied up the bag and that was the last time I saw my key. So brothers and sisters, now I want you all to understand I, I appreciate this church because it's multicultural. Amen. Amen. Where I live, there are not too many people of color. Amen? amen. Now, I'm not prejudiced. Can we say amen? amen? But everybody up where I live can't say that. Amen. <laughs> so can you imagine a black man in a pretty much all-white community digging in the trash in front of Walmart? But I was a man on a mission, can we say amen? <laughs> what is the moral of the story, brothers and sisters? The key was in the food. <laughs> and for many of you, although there are many other health principles that you need to know, the key is in the food. So I had a good time with my brother. Tell him, what are you talking about? Man, I started my car. I was able to start my car just by digging in the trash can. And he started laughing. And of course, you know, once he got the rest of the story, he understood. Appetite is very, very important. Jesus understood how important it was. And so the Bible teaches that to start his public ministry, he fasted 40 days. It is a fast that we've been told none of us will ever have to do. We don't even have a record that there was any water, but we know for sure there was no food. I do believe he was supernaturally sustained by the Lord, by, by his father and by angels, okay? But he understood the importance of appetite and, and conquering it. Yes, brother? Mark 8, 23. He spit in his eyes. Thank you, brother. Especially since I don't have any letters, amen? <laughs> Brother, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. What was that scripture again? <laughs> Mark 8, 23. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let me share something with you, brothers and sisters. It says, Satan is constantly on the alert to bring the race fully under his control. What's he trying to do? His strongest hold on man is through the appetite. And this he seeks to stimulate in every possible way. See, God didn't leave us without instruction. He didn't leave us without knowing the plan of the enemy. And so we even know his strategy. To know the devil's strategy is a powerful advantage. Imagine, I can tell you to what great lengths generals have gone to. Uh, do you know that in the Civil War, they actually hired, which was even illegal at the time, they, they, they hired uh, spiritualist uh, um, fortune tellers to, to tell the South where the North was and to tell the North where the South was, and they're still doing it today. They fight crimes with, um, forget the name of the people, uh, psychics and these kind of things. People go to great lengths to find out a strategy of the enemy. All we have to do is pick it up and read it. And God will tell us. But we're so busy doing other things, watching other things, listening to other things, looking at other things. Listen to this one. Satan gathered the fallen angels together to devise some way of doing the most possible evil to the human family. What's he trying to do? the most possible evil. One proposition after another was made till finally Satan himself thought up a plan. He would take the fruit of the vine and also wheat and other things given by God as food and would convert them into poisons which would ruin man's physical, mental, and moral powers and so overcome the senses that Satan should have full control. I don't know if y'all caught that. Satan said in the early days, Let's have a board meeting. Man, demons having board meetings. They're an organized army. 
and they said we need to do the most possible harm to this human race. Demon over here said, I think we should do this. Demon over here said, oh, no, that's a bad idea. I think we should do this. Another demon said, ha, I've got a better idea. Satan himself then thought up a plan. We're going to take the things that they eat and convert it into poison. And by so doing, we're going to affect them physically, mentally, and spiritually. Has it worked? But did we know the strategy? If we'd read it. Amen? This is an exercise we have to do together. I want you to read with me, and let's read what colors we see. Let's start with the first, letter, first line. Ready? Red, blue, orange, purple. Let's go with the second line. Orange, blue, green, red. Third line. Blue, purple, green, Red. Fourth line. Orange, blue, red, green. Is that what you see? Third, next line. Purple, orange, red, blue. Next line. Green, red, blue, purple. But it sure sounded Babylonian, didn't it? <laughs> that was confusion. Now notice what I said. I said we have an exercise. Tell me the colors that you see. When you started with the first line, everything matched. You saw R-E-D and it was color red. You saw B-L-U-E and it was color blue. Orange, purple the same. Second line the same. But when you get to the third line, it's really green, but it says it's blue. It's really red, but it says it's purple. You didn't even know it. But when you got to that third line, your brain had a conflict. You're going to like this. You're going to like this. Your brain had a conflict. It saw a color that was different than the word. And most of you defaulted to the word. And that's such a blessing. Do you know that God, in a situation like this, your brain will naturally default to the word? I hope you're getting the spiritual significance of this. You see, God knew that we would be in trouble facing a devil, so he gives us a default. If we don't resist the Holy Ghost, we default to the word. It's natural for us to desire, at least want to have peace of mind and to have Jesus in our hearts. Now, now the, the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, but you do have a yearning for something. And only God, once you figure it out, can meet the need of the heart. And so you have, God has put mechanisms in us that cause us to default to the word unless you're hypnotized. They've done psychological studies and when they hypnotize somebody and when the person is fully under the influence of hypnosis and they have them read as fast see I can't even read it right I can go red Red, blue, orange, purple, orange, blue, green, red, blue, red, purple, red. I have to think about it. You can't just go fast. But when you hypnotize a person, they would hypnotize a person and they would ask them to read it. And just as fast as we could read the defaulted word, a hypnotized person can read the color. The devil wants to hypnotize us by hypnotizing us he can color the word of God. I don't think y'all heard what the Holy Spirit just said. Satan exercised his power of hypnotism over Adam and Eve. Now, what was the actual temptation? Food, right? He exercised his power of hypnotism over Adam and Eve, and this power he strove to exercise over Christ. But after the word of scripture was quoted, Satan knew that he had no chance of triumphing. You see, brothers and sisters, 
The reason why some of us aren't healthy, we watch too much TV. And they put all kind of subliminal suggestions. You need butter. You need a beef steak right now. And you just wonder, man, I just had this strong desire for something buttery and beef steaky and whatever, and you don't even realize. You see, the reason why they know what they're doing. Do you know that in witchcraft, when they make a magic wand, do you know what kind of wood they use? It's called Hollywood. I'm not telling you a lie, that's the truth. When they make magic wands in witchcraft, they use Hollywood. And Hollywood, therefore, got its name for the hypnotic power of witchcraft. Okay? So, you've all done it, unfortunately, we've all done it. You watch something and listen to the music. Dun, 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 dun. And then you see somebody creeping to a door. And there's, there's a good person on the other side of that door, right? And you see, they don't even show you the person. You just see the shadow creeping and the music is going. Your heart starts beating. Oh, don't let my wife be in the room. Have mercy. <laughs> don't let him in. Stop. I said, honey, it's just a movie. We, we don't even watch that stuff anymore. But my point being made is some of us definitely don't need to watch it. And, 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 and I want y'all, follow me. You see a shadow. And then you see a hand. And that hand slowly touches the doorknob. And then, just like that, you see the other side of the doorknob turning. And then, just like that, you hear... And he's got you. Scenes don't change like that in real life. We couldn't handle it. I've been looking at the same wonderful people, and you've been listening to the same boring person for half hour, 45 minutes. The scenes haven't changed like that. And when you change those scenes, and you see the hand, and you change the music, and you see the doorknob, and then you hear the crickling of the thing, and then you see the shadow, it does something to you emotionally, and it makes Bible study boring. Because all Bible study is at that point is black ink on white paper. And so whatever they want to suggest subliminally to you, it's there. And so we're just not interested in Bible study. We're just not interested in taking better care of our bodies. We're just not interested in a lot of the things that we need to be interested in in order for us to be well. Satan understands hypnosis, brothers and sisters, and we need to understand that he does not want us to understand what he understands. As we near a close, brothers and sisters, this is how he did it. It was not necessarily an apple. You know, the world, the Hollywood always has an apple, doesn't, don't they? Why do they use an apple? Bob, uh, apple a day takes the doctor away. It's the king of fruit. So they want to paint the apple as the bad fruit, right? We don't know what it was. The Bible just says fruit, okay? But as Satan was enticing, it says in the Bible that Satan, or through the serpent, he was talking to Eve. So he was stimulating her through her what? Sense of? And then the Bible says in Genesis 3, and when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise, it says she took of the fruit thereof and did eat. So you say, well, where is the sense of smell? Did you know that you cannot taste without smell? Didn't know that, huh? The next time you don't want to taste something, just close your nose. <laughs> and you will not taste the food. Because you need the sense of smell in order to taste. And so don't you think anything that God made wasn't good? Because it was, and it had a wonderful aroma. There was nothing evil about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It was a wonderful tree. It was just off limits. 
God made it. It had to smell good. It had to be wonderful fruit, but it wasn't what they were supposed to eat. Okay? Satan didn't invent that tree. It was to be used as a test of their loyalty to God. All right? So Satan uses the five senses, and he does. Now, I know some of you are probably saying, man, that's hogwash. How can Satan, you know, tempt me and, and, and hypnotize me? And he can't hypnotize me with any food. Well, let me just ask you a question. You've all seen people hypnotize, and you didn't even realize. You get a group of guys that don't know some principles. Get a group of girls walking by who don't know some principles and are dressed in a way that lacks clothing. Amen? And these guys are hard at work. <laughs> we don't look at it as hypnotism. But he couldn't even, he hit the wrong nail. Ouch! Because he was watching. He was hypnotized for a brief moment. How many of you vowed and said, okay, I'm not going to eat this anymore. I'm not going to eat it. And you were just shopping. Let's just say, you know, it was a piece of German chocolate cake and you know it might not be the best for you because you need to get rid of some weight and, and, and lower your sugar. You're just walking along and all of a sudden in a store you spot a piece of German chocolate cake and, whoo, Lord, can I start that fast tomorrow? <laughs> Do you see the hypnotic effect? How many of you been there? All of us have. You, you, you're, you're trying to do something and you just can't get your mind? That is an attempt at hypnosis. Every temptation is an attempt at hypnosis. And your only defense is the word of God. Sometimes it comes, you just got to shake it off. Whew, let, let, me, let me just not look. And, and that's why... The Bible doesn't say you can't look at a woman, but you're not supposed to look at a woman to what? Lust after her. So as a general rule, certain body parts, you just keep looking and keep the focus on that for a long time. You're going to be in trouble. Amen? So ladies, you're, our brother, you're your brother's keeper. Have mercy. <laughs> Principles, before we close. As religious aggression subverts the liberties of our nation, those who would stand for freedom of conscience, somebody gave a message on religious liberty, amen, will be placed in unfavorable positions. For their sake, they should, while they have opportunity, become intelligent in regard to four things. We're just talking about some principles. Disease, its causes, prevention, and cure. Now, who's supposed to learn this? Did it say you have to be a medical doctor? Did it say you have to be a registered nurse? No. Who's supposed to learn this? Those who stand for freedom of conscience. Now I want you to follow. God is not stupid. If God says those who stand for freedom of conscience should become intelligent in regard to disease, its causes, how to prevent it, and how to cure it, that automatically means that it does not require letters behind your name to learn those four things. Amen. I don't know if you caught that. Amen. Somebody got it. Amen. Amen. Yes, if God requires something, he fits you up with the ability to do what he requires. So that means that, where's the, um, oh, she's probably not even in here, I don't think. Um, there was a sister that was supposed to interpret for me, and uh, she, she's probably not in here. I was going to give her a break right about now because I've taken a long time and memorized a long word. It's called Numano Ultra Microscopic Silico Volcano Coniosis. Now, if I stood up before you, y'all would have probably thought I had a whole bunch of letters behind my name. I can say it again. I really can. Numano Ultra Microscopic Silico Volcano Coniosis. Now, you say, well, what is that? I'm illustrating a point. Have you ever heard of a disease that coal miners get? Somebody said it. Black lung. 
Did you know that the medical term for black lung is pneumonal ultramicroscopic silicovolcano coniosis? Now, you're not feeling well. You go to the doctor, my brother. You're laying on your bed, and the doctor walks in and sits on the bed. What's your name, brother? James. James, I've got some bad news. You've got pneumono ultra microscopic <laughs> silico volcano. Sounds like I'm being buried under the earth, right? <laughs> Coniosis. Now, you just want to roll over and die, right? But if the doctor says, James, you've been working in the coal mines too long. It's time to retire. You got a little case of black lung. Just knowing what it is, it's not that it's a great thing, but it gives you a peace of mind because you know what it is. You see, a language has been created that puts a whole bunch of roots together so that the average person won't understand his body. How come we just can't say heart attack? Why does it have to be a myocardial infarction? <laughs> Do y'all understand what I'm saying? So, so, so you've heard of heart attack, right? Right. So now you understand how it's done. In modern medicine, roots are put together. And you can even get a book if you want to spend your time, waste your time, spend your time uh, 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 learning it, um, you can get a book and it'll teach you about all the roots and the little uh, uh, words to put in between. Sometimes you put an O in between different roots to, 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 to make it connect, you know, and, and that's how it's done. And so they learn a language that the common person does not understand. And they learn it so well that they forget English sometimes. <laughs> and not all of them, but some of them they can't even speak English. I'm not talking, I'm not bad-mouthing doctors. There are some excellent doctors. I hope there's some in here tonight. I mean, today. I'm not going to keep you to tonight, amen. I hope there's some in here today because there's some good ones. I've got some good friends, and the best ones can speak English. But some of them, they've forgotten how to say the disease in plain English. And it leaves the people so that's why you have to take it upon yourself to follow God's principles. We're going to learn about disease this afternoon, um, but here's a point that we can go to right now. Um, let me see. I went the wrong way. Sorry about that. The iPhone is upside down. No wonder. Wait a minute. Now the iPhone is right side up, but the hypnotized speaker is uh, <laughs> not doing it right. One more quote, brothers and sisters, and then we're going to close with this because this will help us springboard into this afternoon. We're going to be talking this afternoon about some diseases, and it's not going to be so much of a major presentation. We want to take questions. We want to talk to you about what God has shown us about various diseases and give you all some of the important nuts and bolts. Okay, we're, we're near, we're almost there. Okay, all right, this is what the Lord says. This is from a book called Ministry of Healing, it's, and it's four things. This is our, we, we, we just have a summary slide right after that that just, that just mentions the four things and then we're closing. It says, in case of sickness, now I want y'all to understand this, Ministry of Healing, it is said of that book that it contains the wisdom of the great physician. It was primarily a book for medical professionals, primarily, so that they would understand the principles and what they need to know to teach the people. In case of sickness, the cause should be ascertained. Unhealthful conditions should be changed. Wrong habits corrected. Then nature is to be assisted in her effort to expel impurities. To do what? Now, if you were listening carefully, the first three deal with what we often call the eight laws of health. 
It says we should ascertain the cause. Have I been drinking water? Have I been exercising? Cause rhymes with laws, and that's how you know whether, you're, wh whether your lifestyle is causing a disease. You ascertain the cause. Then it says you change unhealthful conditions. The things around you that aren't healthful, change them. Then the repeated actions, which are habits, it says correct the wrong ones. Drink water instead of soda pops and those kinds of things. After you've done all of that, it says, then you assist nature in her effort to expel impurities and to reestablish right conditions in the system. That goes along on the same page. There's a definition of disease that's not on our screen. It says disease is an effort of nature to free the system from conditions that result from a violation of the laws of health. There would be more healing if we as a people understood the principal need of detoxifying our body. Okay? That's what that quote is saying. In the Bible, healing was often connected with cleansing in principle. Okay? So we have a biblical basis. And so as we come together this afternoon, we want to just remember that we ascertain the cause, we change unhelpful conditions, we correct wrong habits, and then we assist nature in her effort to expel impurities. Before I let you go, I want to show you a tree. This is not the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That tree is actually in the Garden of Gethsemane. And based on its width, it would have stood when Jesus walked through that garden when he was about to die for your sins. It is quite possible that it's a tree Jesus fell upon, leaned upon. Some of his drops of blood could have, could have fallen on this very tree. And we want to understand that Jesus made a great sacrifice for us. He could have continued to eat, to do whatever he wanted to do, but he gave up a lot in order to save you and I. And I want to end because it is a sacrifice for you to change some of your eating habits. And the only way the change will be meaningful and not legalistic is if you keep ever before you the cross of Jesus Christ. Oh, brothers and sisters, when Jesus died, there's one thing that you don't know about a Roman cross. You know about the nails in, his, in the hands. You know about the nails in the feet. You know also that they pierced him in the side. But let me tell you something else about a Roman cross. The Roman cross, they sharpened a piece of metal usually and made it very sharp like a triangle, and they put it right underneath the gluteus maximus. And I am going to use the medical term for that. Amen. And in order to breathe, you had to pull up on nail-pierced hands and push up on nail-pierced feet, and you would get a few breaths, and then your you, your, your muscles would fatigue and you would drop right onto that pointed object. They were masters of torture. But a strong man could survive for days. But because the sacrimonious Pharisees didn't want bodies that they had condemned on the cross on the high Sabbath day of the Passover, they said, we've got to kill these men. And so they gave orders and they broke the legs of the two. When they came to Jesus and the Bible says that he was dead already, they pierced him in the side. Some people think there was some kind of magic to blood and water. And we preach some good sermons. Oh, the blood covers and the water purifies. There was nothing magical. Jesus died of a ruptured heart. And as that fluid filled up in his cavity, it separated just like it does in a laboratory. The red cells go down to the bottom. The clearer fluids are at the top. So when they pierced him in the side, the Bible does not say the, the, that, that the two fluids just came out together. What would have happened is they pierced him in the side, the red cells would have come, and then the clear fluid would have come, and they said, whoa, henceforth fluids blood and water. Jesus did not die of crucifixion. Jesus died to save us from destroying ourselves. And I pray that as you contemplate something that you might need to give up, can't give up everything at the same time, some improvement in your health. Maybe you haven't been exercising and you need to. Maybe you haven't been drinking water and you need to. Uh, 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 whatever it is, I want you to think about Jesus and the sacrifice that he made for you on Calvary. 
Thank you.